Thank you. Good morning and welcome to worship this morning on a frosty morning on this first day of July, first Sunday of July. On behalf of the congregation, I welcome all visitors and invite all to morning tea in the hall following the service. Thank you. Creator God calls to us, my beloved, my beloved, here I am, we utter, here we are, O God. Our God is drawing us to a new place beyond our understanding, beyond our comprehension. In a leap of faith and a posture of trust, we gather here together. Our loving God draws us into this place of holy mystery where divine presence and human experience meet. Come, Spirit of God, come. Embolden and awaken in us new depths of faith and trust. Kindle a fire of love inside of us, we pray. Amen.
Gracious God, Your presence is always with us. We ask that You will open our hearts and minds before You, so that we will confess our sins and find forgiveness. Gracious God, we hear Your call to set out, to go to the place in the distance that You have shown us. But we are afraid to go. We fear it will cost us too much, cut too deep, and claim that which is most sacred and precious to us. But perhaps even more than this, we know that we can't get to those places by ourselves. We must go beyond ourselves and encounter You as our provider in a way that feels so risky and vulnerable. And so, we name and acknowledge those places in us that are full of doubt and fear, those parts of us that prefer to play it safe. Forgive us, O God, and make this a new place we name after Your faithfulness and provision. Give us strength to walk boldly into the fullness of who You created us to be. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God meets us in this place of honesty with great tenderness, with a love that transforms our fears bit by bit. God sees to it. You are forgiven. God has seen to it. Thanks be to God. We're going to have a presentation on our church weekend away, and I'm going to invite Gareth to come to the front, please. Well, Gareth, the church weekend away, we haven't had one for a while. When was the last one we had? Pre COVID, I think, from memory. Certainly, last time we met for a parish weekend away was pre COVID. I think we're going back to 2.15. Oh, no, 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 no. 2.19, I think. Or 2.19. Yeah. <laughs> yes. But certainly not of the recent times. Well, that was the past. What about the future? What are the dates of the weekend away this year? So we have the opportunity to meet together once again as a parish for a weekend from Friday evening of the 10th of November until Sunday afternoon of the 12th of November. And who is our guest speaker? We've, uh, well, due to David's contacts, we've actually been able to invite the Reverend Mike Wilson, who was the previous State Director of Ministry and Missions, has himself been a missionary and has been a leader in cross-cultural mission. and. Uh, He's now retired, but he is delighted to be invited and delighted to be our speaker in November. And has he given us any indication as to what theme he might follow over the weekend? He has indeed, and I'm going to quote him in a minute, but he actually wants to speak about the tabernacle, the tabernacle of God, 
And this is what he says. Is this a fair summary of the Bible? It tries to motivate us to live in God's presence and tells us to sort ourselves out to make this possible. No, not at all. That's completely upside down and back to front. Rather, Mike says, the Bible presents us with a God who longs to share his presence with us. It tells of this extraordinary lengths to which he has gone to make this possible. So Mike will start with uh, John 1.14, the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. And on November the 10th and the 12th, he says, we will dig into the rich soil of John's gospel. We will dig for priceless pearls. Well, having had some experience of uh, Mike's ministry, I know that we will certainly benefit greatly from what he shares with us, from the insights that he has uh, in Scripture, particularly in relation to John's Gospel. Gareth, can you give us a, a, just a quick summary of how the weekend will pan out? Well, the first thing you probably know, need to know is that our parish weekend away will be once again at the Warren Bowie Conference Centre. It's helpful to know where it is, isn't it? It is, yeah. which is just uh, <clears throat> a, a few kilometres past Murren Bateman, so about 45 minutes from here, which means we get a chance to actually withdraw from the busyness of city life and the day-to-day -day run. I think that uh, when we run these weekends away, we base them around food. Not that that's the priority, but there will, when people arrive on Friday night, there will be supper. And then on, on, on Saturday, we will have breakfast and then some discussion time and hear what Mike wants to say, then let's have morning tea. And then that will continue, then lunch. Then we will continue a little bit more with Mike and then the afternoon is free for us to do things like explore the Australian bush or a jigsaw puzzle. Last year we had archery, which was very popular for all ages, and I'm more than happy to shout archery again. Uh, and then we must come back for afternoon tea, uh, and then that night we'll enjoy dinner and then have a special activities night, uh, not planned yet, but. We've done trivial pursuits, we've done concerts, we've done games. You might have ideas of what you want to be part of that, but Saturday night will be just a time where ages, people of all ages can mix and enjoy a great time. And then Sunday, of course breakfast, uh, but then an opportunity where everyone that is at the weekend away can participate in some way in a church service together. A very special time that we've really enjoyed in the past. And we'll have lunch and then return back to our homes. We certainly won't return home hungry, that's for sure. No. no. Um, for those folk who maybe aren't interested in actually being part of the weekend in a residential sense, uh, is there an opportunity for people to just come for the day on Saturday? We're maybe not encouraging that, but is it possible? Absolutely. So, as I said, we are, the reason we go to Warren Bowie uh, Conference Centre is because it actually provides rooms uh, for four people with uh, ensuite facilities. So, it's definitely not roughing it. Um, but even some people might say, well, they're not even staying in a, a room with an ensuite facility, still not quite their cup of tea. Um, so there is the opportunity for people to come for a day visit on the Saturday. You could come out and uh, join us a bit after breakfast and then uh, take part in most of what Mike talks about, enjoy the afternoon of activities and certainly the activities at night, uh, enjoy dinner with us and then head back to Canberra. That is an alternative. Um, you'll miss parts of what Mike's doing and parts of it but you will actually be there for a so, good, so, good so, part so, of it. So while it's possible, uh, we really would like people there for the whole weekend. Absolutely. Um, just to sort of wind up, Gareth, uh, can you give us any indicate, just two quick practical matters. First of all, 
In terms of costs, can you give us any idea about that at this stage, whether individual, family, or whatever? So you might be thinking, this is in November. Why launch it now? Well, this is so you can budget, start putting some money aside. It will cost just over $200 for each adult, a bit over $185 for each student, and a bit over $175 for each primary school student. And if you're a family, yes, that does, does add up, but we're giving you the opportunity to save from now to November to, so that you can be there. Um, so those are the figures for those that would be there for the whole weekend. Uh, the Saturday, if people just come for the Saturday, that will be obviously a little bit less, and we will have full registration forms and that available from next Sunday. Uh, and that really is the last point then. How do people who are expressing interest, how do they book? So we will uh, put information in the bulletin. We will have an information table in the hall, but there will also be ways in the bulletin that you can email and bank transfer and you can, from the, uh, the, the joy of your own home, you can register for our weekend away. Um, but if you have any questions or comments or you want to know any further details, there will be people in the hall um, from now till November that you can talk to and uh, ask any questions you wish. Thank you, Gareth. Thank you. Pleasure. Look forward to having as many of you there as possible. children in the congregation this morning. I know it's school holidays now, but if there are any, this is your time to go through to the hall for your program. <clears throat> the Old Testament lesson is Genesis 22, 1 to 14. This is the word of God for the people of God. Some time later, God tested Abraham. 
He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah, sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son, Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkeys while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son, Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in a thicket he saw a ram, caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
The New Testament lesson this morning comes from Matthew chapter 10, starting at verse 40. Hear the word of God. Anyone who welcomes you welcomes me, and anyone who welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet as a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person as a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And if anyone gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones who is my disciple, truly I tell you, that person will certainly not lose their reward. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This morning's announcements can be found in the bulletin, but uh, there are a couple that are not there. Firstly, there is an exchange of sheet music this afternoon at the Western Creek Church at 3 until 4.30 p.m. And all are invited if you have sheet music to exchange or you would like to see what is an offer at the Western Creek Church. The church hall looks absolutely amazing for Holiday Club this week. I would ask all members of the congregation to pray each day this week for the Holiday Club and its success. And thank you to all those leaders who have spent so much time putting together the program and making the hall ready. Please enjoy the hall this morning as you have morning tea. Many of you know Pam Anderson and she is involved in a number of activities and often people look for her on a Sunday. Pam will be away at short notice for a month. Her brother has died suddenly in Northern Ireland and she's gone to be with the family. And this morning we mark the, the end of um, Margaret McLeod and Ivan Denert here at, in the choir. Margaret and Ivan are leaving us next weekend for Queensland and we sincerely thank them for their contribution to this church. Ivan served as the village chaplain for a short period of time and has assisted on the preaching roster. And Margaret is an elder of our church and is chair of the board of management at the village and also has served the choir as Ivan has done too. So Margaret and Ivan, we pray Godspeed for your journey and every blessing on your new home and your new life in Queensland. And we hope you will visit us when it's warmer at times. Thank you. Thank you.
Matthew uh, Arnold, uh, an English poet and cultural critic, was known as a relentless, fierce agnostic and critic of the Christian faith. He said that the Christian faith is irrational, infantile, and archaic, impossible for a progressive 19th century educated Englishman like him to believe in. When Arnold died, Robert Louis Stevenson said, poor Matthew, he's gone to heaven, no doubt, but he won't like God. Well, maybe this was a presumption on Stevenson's part. I don't know. Sometimes the greatest challenge of being a Christian in today's world is to love the God we've got rather than, like Matthew Arnold, the God we thought we deserved. When we speak directly about the God we've got, rather than all our little idols and godlets we create for ourselves, we are sometimes shocked by who God really is. It's only five weeks since Pentecost Sunday when we were reminded that God sent down fire upon us, shaking us up, sending us out, when all we really wanted was a little comfortable spirituality. The Old Testament lectionary reading for today is taken from Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 to 14. It is one of the most important, one of the strangest, and most troubling stories in the whole of the Bible. Because of its strangeness, we don't hear it read or preached from very often. I've even heard that some preachers boast about the fact that they never preach from Genesis chapter 22. But you've come to church on a winter Sunday morning when many others have stayed away for all sorts of reasons, maybe because they think it's too cold. So perhaps you're up for the challenge of Genesis 22. So let's see what we can make of this story. Our story takes place in the dim, distant days of Israel's prehistory. Abraham and his wife Sarah, even though they are very old and childless, have been promised a child from which a great family would arise. This family, known as Israel, would bless all the families of the world. When the child Isaac is born, he is a sure sign of God's blessing on Abraham. Isaac is Abraham's hope, indeed his only hope. When Isaac is a young boy, God, remember the very same God who gave Abraham and Sarah the gift of Isaac, calls out, Abraham, verse 1a, Abraham faithfully replies, I'm here, verse 1b. Then follows the shocking assignment. Verse 2, then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. 
how can this be? Can it be that the God who had so miraculously loved Abraham by giving him a son can now demand that son's life? It's unthinkable. Early the next morning, he saddles his donkey, gathers wood for the fire of offering, and sets out with Isaac and a couple of others for the place God had told him to go. The distance was about 70 kilometers. When they get to Mount Moriah, Abraham and Isaac leave the others, and with the wood and a jagged knife in hand, set off up the mountain to, of all things, worship. Verse 5, and this worship was going to involve, it appeared, a sacrifice. Isaac said, verse 7b, the fire and wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham replied, verse 8, God Himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. There on the mountain, Abraham built an altar, laid the wood, bound his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. The feature of this story that never ceases to amaze me is how compliant Isaac was with what his father was doing. He could easily have run away. He had enough strength and ability and agility to do that. But incredibly, he stayed and was quite prepared to lie down on that altar. Abraham raised the knife to kill his son, his only son. And then he heard these words, verse 11 and 12. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Nearby there was a ram caught in the thicket. The ram was killed and offered on the fire in the place of Isaac. Abraham named the place Jehovah-Jireh, meaning the Lord will provide. Wow! What a story! It's a story that has always raised more questions than we've ever been able to fully answer. It would be foolish of me to try and fully explain this mysterious disturbing ancient story. How could Abraham possibly have been so confused as to think that God wanted the sacrifice of His one and only Son? What would lead him to imagine that the God who gave him the most precious gift would now turn and demand that gift be given back. Did the writer of Genesis believe that God puts people through terrible ordeals such as the one on Mount Moriah in order to see if they will do anything, anything God tells them to do? Abraham is listed as one of the heroes of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 17 and 18. By faith Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son, 
even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. The 10th century Danish Christian philosopher Søren Kierkegaard calls Abraham a knight of faith. Faith is a word we often use in everyday conversation. We say of someone, he or she is a person of faith. We sometimes say of ourselves, it was my faith that brought me through. What is faith? Maybe faith is unquestioning obedience. In the story before us, God commands, and Abraham obeys without receiving an explanation or giving an argument. God says, take your son, your only son, as if to underscore the magnitude of what is being asked. In other words, take your future, relinquish control of the significance of your life, your hope for yourself and your family, and give it all back to God. In other words, come up on the mountain and worship me by loving me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That is with everything we've got. Perhaps you're asking the question, can worshiping God be this demanding? Howard Gross wrote a Christian song. I don't think we're familiar with it. It's probably sung, was sung years ago in the United States. Some of the words go like this, give of your best to the master. Give him the strength of your youth. Abraham tells his companions that he and Isaac are going up on the mountain to worship. Can worship of the true and living God possibly be this costly? Remember what the psalmist said in Psalm 122, verse 1a, I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Can we rejoice if worship is linked to such extravagant sacrifice? Step by agonizing step, Abraham and his son walked toward the mountain. He had a three-day walk to think about what he was being asked to do. And his son went step by step with him away from home. Kierkegaard says that each step taken toward God or in obedience to God is an act of faith. Faith is not one decision that we make in some emotional moment in our lives. It's every step away from home, away from our past, and another step toward God. Back in Northern Ireland, where I grew up, we used the expression many a time to describe some people who had become Christians. We said of them, they got saved and then they got stuck. Kierkegaard, who thought as deeply about faith in God as anybody, 
stresses that faith is not proof, not secure rationale. It's a leap over 10,000 fathoms without adequate intellectual foundation or sure destination. Abraham has not only been spoken of as a man of faith, but also, interestingly, as the first disciple. He is in exactly the same situation as the disciples whom Jesus called. Remember what Jesus said to those people? He said, follow me. They had to venture forth with Jesus step by step, without any clear sense of destination, without any assurance of where Jesus will eventually lead them. Every time somebody responds with the words, I'm here, Lord, that person is venturing forth without guarantees. That person is relinquishing control. Lest you be numb to the shock of this ancient story, please note how it ends. Abraham remembered Mount Moriah not as the place where he committed a terrible act in the name of God, but where he dared to venture forth and completely, unreservedly trust his God. He found that the Lord not only orders and commands, but he discovered something else. The Lord provides. Maybe Abraham was confused about God, thinking that God was like the gods of the people around him who actually practiced child sacrifice, offering up their children to their angry gods. Abraham discovered that if he would attempt step by step by step to obey God, to place himself at God's disposal, God would provide and give him what he needed in order to be faithful, to stay in relationship with the God who had commandeered his future. God would provide. That is, God would make a way when Abraham thought there was no way. Isn't that what we Christians believe happened on another mountain many, many years later? When a son of Abraham, whose name was Jesus, was sacrificed for us. When we look at the cross, perhaps we think that our future was over. But on that cruel cross at Calvary, God made a way. When we thought there was no way. By following the one who said to his father in the garden, not my will, but your will be done, we discovered the truth about God. God provided for us in Christ a way of forgiveness of all our sins. He provided a way for us to worship God in His holy presence. 
We could never have devised this for ourselves. Jesus commands us to follow Him in the world, to sacrifice our ambitions for material accumulation and worldly power, to turn the other cheek, to forgive our enemies, to walk down the narrow path of the cross. Only God has a right to commandeer our lives in such risky service. In our modern culture, we have bought into the notion that it's possible to live our lives without pain, risk, or sacrifice. I doubt that's possible if we are attempting to be faithful to the God of Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Jesus. Don't tell me that the story from Genesis chapter 22 is irrelevant and primitive for us modern, sophisticated, progressive people. I'm sure that there are people in this congregation right now who know all about the path that Abraham walked up to Mount Moriah. When you walk not knowing where the journey ends, when you walk step by step with nothing to uphold you but the faith that God is love, that God's will for your life is good, and that your salvation lies in obedience to God. This is the God we've got. Where is the Lamb? John the Baptist said, There He is. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God has provided for us. And He sacrificed that Lamb on the cross for you and for me so that we can come to Him today and trust Him, put our faith in Him, and experience His forgiveness. What a God we've got. Amen. God, you see to it that we have what we need so we can give it to you. We lean into your loving care for us through the offering of our gifts. O oh God, take what we bring and do something beautiful with it through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
We come now to <coughs> excuse me. We come now to our prayers for the people. Let us pray. Most generous God, you are ever ready to give good gifts to your people, your children. We ask you receive our prayers of the people of the world and of the church. We pray for the nations of our world, for an end to war, for peace, for wise government and just sharing of the resources of the earth. Hear our prayers for those who are tortured or held in prison, for those taken from their families and land, for your little ones who are dying of hunger and thirst. Show us your love in these, your people, and help us to minister to those as we would minister to you. God of grace, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for your church, for visionary leadership and for faithful discipleship, for unity between Christians, for the mission of the church throughout the world. Hear our prayers for all who are ministers of your gospel for all who unsettle us with your words of truth, for your little ones who are crying out for words of forgiveness and grace. As we think of little ones, we think of St Andrew's Holiday Club during this coming week. We pray for the faithful leadership and we ask for your care them in all they do to share the gospel with these little ones and we pray for the little ones that their hearts may be opened and grow in the knowledge of your love for them we pray for our community for loving nurture of your people your children and care for the vulnerable, for respect for individuals and concern for the well-being of all. Hear our prayers for those who are strangers or newcomers, for those who are homeless, destitute or without work, for your little ones who are hurting from rejection and abuse. Show us your face in these people and children and help us to welcome them as we would welcome you. God of grace, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all in need or distress, for comfort, for the grieving, and for hope for the despairing, for companionship for the lonely, and relief for those in pain. Hear our prayers for those who are shut away from society, the disabled and the frail, for those who long for, co for a comforting touch or a kindly word, for your little ones who are starved of love and affection. We pray especially for those we know personally and ask you, God, for your comforting touch and kindly word. And we just pause for a moment while any people we know can be silently named. And God, there are a number of people in our congregation that most of us know, including Colin Lewis, Stella Lease, Colin Cartwright, Ken Crawford, who are also in need of your comforting touch and kindly word. 
Show us your face in these people and help us to care for them as we would care for you. God of grace, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for all who have died in your love and faith, the many good and holy people who have recognised who you are. We give thanks and remember particularly the faithful people of this parish of St Andrews. We want to give thanks for the life of Pam Anderson's brother who passed away this week and ask you to be with and care for Pam in her travels to Northern Ireland to be with her family. We pray that you give each family and the loved ones associated with these faithful people your people, your peace and comfort that they need in their particular circumstances. Show us your faith, face and let us hear your voice that we also may welcome you into our lives and with all your saints receive from you the gift of everlasting life. God of grace, in your mercy, Hear our prayer through our wonderful Saviour, Jesus Christ, and hear us as together we lift up our voices in the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen.
So go carrying as much of God's love as we can. Let Jesus teach us the way of trust, and may you overflow with Holy Spirit confidence in God's faithful provision this day and always. Thank you.